Thank you very much for inviting me to give an update on novel combination strategies. These are my disclosures. I'm first going to talk about combination therapies, studies from ASLD, then stopping nukes and the role in combination therapy, and then surface antigen loss abstract on natural history. So the first study I'm going to discuss is the triple combination of J&J's 3989 RNAi capsid assembly modulator and nucleoside analog from MFUN of 12 chronic hepatitis B Asian patients, four of them e-antigen positive, most nucleoside analog experience, who received RNAi three injections of 200 milligrams on days 1, 29, and 57, a capsid assembly modulator, 250 milligrams a day for 12 weeks from days 1 to 85, and nucleoside analog, either intecavir or tenofovir, started or continued on day one throughout the study. And at day 113, two months post RNAi dosing and one month after end of capsid dosing, efficacy and safety data was evaluated. This slide shows the surface antigen changes from baseline to day 113 with triple therapy. On the top left, you can see the surface antigen levels in each patient. You see the J&J &J CAM 6379 from day one to 85, the three injections of the RNAi, and the continued decrease in surface antigen. The bottom left, shows the mean surface antigen level over time. In blue is the log change from day one to day 113. And in orange, the actual values mean. 12 of 12 patients had greater than one log drop in surface antigen from day one, uh, the nadir was day 85 in one patient and day 113 in the other 11. 10 of the 12 achieved surface antigen less than 100 after 12 weeks of triple therapy. The bottom right shows the change from day one to day 113, and you can see it ranged from minus one to minus 2.2. It was this, no different in the antigen positive and negative patients. This slide shows HBB DNA in patients who had greater than 100 IUs per mil on day one. And you can see a rapid decline over the first month of therapy, except in one patient who had a very high level at 7.7 .7 logs. But this declined to 3.5 logs by day 113. The bottom left shows HBV RNA in the nine patients with quantifiable HBV RNA at day one and six of them had levels less than lower limit of quantitation by day 29. Patients positive on day one for E antigen and correlated antigen had less pronounced reductions in these parameters. This triple therapy was safe without deaths or discontinuations. There were no clinically significant laboratory findings except for five grade one transient isolated ALT elevations, which resolved with continued dosing and were associated temporarily with reduction of viral parameters. In conclusion, it's the first study to evaluate the efficacy and safety of triple combination therapy, RNAi, capsid assembly modulator, and a nuke. It was well tolerated with robust reductions in surface antigen, HBV DNA, and HBV RNA. All patients achieved greater than one log reduction in surface antigen, nadir from minus one to minus 2.26. Surface antigen reductions were similar in E-antigen positive and negative patients. Studies of longer duration with this triple combination are underway, aimed at assessing functional cure in patients with chronic hepatitis B. The next abstract is the timing and administration of anti-PD-1 in evaluating HBV-specific immune responses in AAV-HBV mice. 
The study's aims were to assess whether therapeutic vaccine could increase HPV-specific T cell responses. The vaccine to Corin Poll was given 28 and 49 days after HPV chronicity was established in the mice, and then to evaluate if anti-PD-1 enhanced immunogenicity. At day 63, splenocytes and intrahepatic lymphocytes were isolated, gamma interferon was assessed by LE spot and T cell proliferation, ALT, HBV DNA, and surface antigen parameters were measured throughout. On the right hand figure is the vaccination and dosing scheme. Group one is the vaccine alone, PD1 is given in groups 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 and the isotype control in groups 3, 5, 7, 9, 11. These are the results from the splenocytes. A therapeutic vaccine induced gamma interferon in secreting T cells in group one, and addition of PD-1 with or after the vaccine did not improve immunogenicity on the left, nor proliferative capacity on the right. And most mice had 100% receptor occupancy with anti-PD-1. These are the intrahepatic lymphocyte results. The therapeutic vaccine induced gamma secreting T cells in the liver, as you can see on the left in group one. In addition of PDV1, improved immunogenicity, but they stated that isotype control also did, but didn't show any data. Addition of anti-PD1 improved the proliferative capacity on the right, but only in group six, where anti-PD-1 was given a week after the booster vaccine. Receptor occupancy was not 100% in the liver and it did not correlate with immune responses nor proliferation. So they studied HPV DNA and surface antigen. There was absolutely no change. ALT results were not given. In conclusion, they said that anti-PD-1 receptor occupancy did not correlate with immune responses and anti-PD-1 should not be given with therapeutic vaccine or given at least one week after booster vaccination to see a beneficial effect. Now I want to look at studies of stopping nukes at ASLD in 2020. The first is the Retract B study showing surface antigen loss is higher among Caucasians compared to Asians after stopping nucleoside analog therapy. It's the result from large global multi-ethnic cohort of 1,541 patients, mainly Asian, predominantly genotypes B and C, small number cirrhotic. The mean quantitative surface antigen at stopping nukes was 2.6 and they had normal ALT. Surface antigen loss after discontinuation was 3% at one year and 14% at four years. Univariate analysis showed that surface antigen loss was higher amongst older patients, 18% at four years compared to younger, 9%. Higher on those receiving tenofovir, 17% at four years versus entecavir, 12%. No different between E antigen positive and negative. And higher among Caucasians, 41% at four years compared to 11% in Asians. Multivariate analysis showed that only the Asian Caucasian difference was statistically significant and Caucasian had a six times higher likelihood of clearing than Asians. Retreatment occurred in 30% at one year and 56% at four years. 1% of patients had decompensation and a similar number died. The next study from the HBRN with Nora Turo showed a randomized controlled trial of 196 weeks of tenofovir with or without pegylated interferon for the first 24 weeks, followed by protocolized withdrawal in adults. And on the right in the graph, you can see the percent of surface antigen loss, which increased during therapy in the tenofovir plus interferon level but after therapy was discontinued, increased in the tenofovir level, so there was no difference at week 240. Tenofovir was stopped if patients' HPV DNA was under 1,000, they did not have cirrhosis, they were E antigen negative and anti-E positive. 
the table shows the surface antigen loss on those who stopped nukes and those who did not. It was 6.3% in those who stopped nukes and 2.6% in those who did not. Inactive status was higher in those who did not stop but maintained tenofovir at 64% compared to 30% who stopped. There was no benefit, they concluded, of PEG tenofovir over tenofovir alone. They noted similar flares between the two groups, but flares occurred mainly during interferon and PEG uh, interferon and tenofovir therapy, whereas with tenofovir alone, flares occurred after withdrawal. They note that you should, may need longer follow-up to assess surface loss. The next study is a small study from Calgary looking at a single center experience on the efficacy of stopping nuke therapy in patients with chronic hep B. It was 1,337 patients, 47 stopped therapy on MD recommendation, which was low surface antigen and low fibrosis. Six who restarted all had flares from 139 to 1467 ALT, and they all occurred in the first six months after stopping nukes. Of interest, quantitative surface was very low at the time of stopping nukes from 2 to 205. 41 patients are still off nuke therapy, and one has lost surface antigen so far. The last study is a surface antigen loss in community-based untreated chronic hepatitis B cohort, the REVEAL study of 4,100 patients. And they took 707 patients who did not have hepatitis C, were not cirrhotic, and at least three data points in the last five years of follow-up. 5.8 had lost surface antigen, and the vast majority had not. They did the quantitative surface antigen at baseline. In those who lost surface antigen, it was 282, whereas in those who did not lose surface antigen, it was 1196. I took the baseline to mean the first of the three time points. They then went on to analyze changes over time. And you can see in the box plots that in red are the patients who did not clear surface antigen and their quantitative surface did not change. Whereas in blue, they did clear and you can see a stepwise decrease in surface antigen. And their analysis statistically said that the rapid surface antigen decline of 0.5 logs per year predicted surface loss. And that was as good as a previous analysis using 200 actual value plus 0.5 per year and better than using a level less than 200 alone. So in summary, there were few studies on combination therapy reported at ASLD except with nuke therapy. And there are multiple combinations. The timing of the combinations are unclear. DAAs can have a profound reduction of quantitative surface but will this lead to long-term inactive off-treatment state or even loss of surface antigen? Or will more be needed to obtain a functional cure with loss of surface antigen, such as interferon, other immune modulators or therapeutic vaccine? And I guess one of the questions coming up from ASLD is response-guided therapy needed or will you need to stop nukes to achieve functional cure? I don't know the answer. Thank you very much.